Hello and welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, your host, and we, are, of course, are back with another innovator interview. Today, we want to talk about coral. Coral reefs are at risk. More than half of the world's coral has died since 1970. If, and if that doesn't set alarm bells ringing for you, consider that a University of Santa, uh, California Santa Barbara study published in Nature in August 2020 found that sea-sourced meat, in other words, protein, is essential to feeding humans in the year 2050. We must increase sea yields by up to 74% to keep up with demand. But coral reefs are a critical feature of the food chain in the oceans. And if they disappear, we cannot meet the dietary needs of humans. The entire ocean ecosystem could collapse. But there are also glimmers of hope, such as a large healthy reef recently discovered near Tahiti that has not suffered bleaching. Our guest today is Sam Teacher, who co-founded Coral Vita, a social enterprise that grows resilient corals on land and then transfers them to the sea to restore dying reefs. Sam's recently uh, contributed an article to Earth 911 called Coral Vita and the Vital Importance of Restoring Coral Reefs. I urge you to take a read of that. We'll have a link in the article that goes with this podcast. And he also previously worked on climate resilience initiatives at the, uh, or for the Obama administration and the Global Island Partnership. Sam was an inaugural Earthshot Prize winner and a Forbes 30 Under 30 social entrepreneur, and he also has co-authored the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, number 14, Life Below Water. He's definitely uh, ready to talk about the topic, and let's get into it. You can more, learn more about Coral Vita at coralvita.co. That's uh, one word, coralvita.co. Welcome to the show, Sam. How are you today? Great to be here, Mitch. Really excited for the conversation and appreciate the invitation and opportunity to speak with you and everyone listening. Well, hey, thank you for the article, too. It was really informative, and I hope everybody takes a look at it. Now, you have a really deep background in the study of oceans and climate resilience. Can you give a grade to humanity in terms of its stewardship of the planet's coral reefs? How are we doing so far? Uh, unfortunately, I'd, I'd give us an F at this point. It's remarkable that my job even has to exist. I didn't grow up mm -hmm. thinking I was going to be a coral farmer, as you know, idyllic as that sounds. Uh, we shouldn't be living in a world where coral reef restoration is even necessary. But as you said, half the world's reefs are already dead, and we're on track to lose only 90% if we hit the 1.5 degree warming goals that have sort of been set out that at this point are seeming further and further out of reach. And, and there's a real chance that over 99% of the world's reefs could die in our lifetimes. And there's a lot of really difficult uh, terrible and intractable problems around the world. Uh, some that are, are recent, others that have existed really since the dawn of humanity, be it, you know, in access to education or women's rights or criminal justice. But we're talking about something that's been going on for maybe 50 years and we've got about 30 years until there's a world without reach. So that is fully on humans. Um, and we really got to get our act together because in addition to being an absolutely incredible ecological wonderland, they are critically important, not just for biodiversity and life in the ocean, but but actually for humanity itself. There's up to a billion people in over 100 countries and territories that depend on reefs. They generate $2.7 trillion annually in goods and services through protecting coastlines from storms as natural breakwaters or powering tourism economies. So reef dying is as much an ecological tragedy as it is a socioeconomic catastrophe, and we are the only ones that can make a difference to ensure that they survive for future generations. So tell us why bleaching happens in the first place. It has to do both with the temperature of the water and the acidity of the water. Yeah, there's a few things at play. I'll start by saying that a coral is an animal that mm -hmm. has plants living inside of it that makes rock as its skeleton. Pretty incredible three for one there. When you think about the coral as an animal, uh, ancient distant cousins of jellyfish, and they have, uh, they're composed of these coral polyps uh, within one coral that you're looking at, and they have like little tentacles that can take plankton out of the water. But for the most part, uh, a lot of the uh, food that corals obtain comes from this algae that lives inside the coral. It's also mm -hmm. what gives the coral its, uh, its beautiful colors. And through photosynthesis, all the algae, as they get the protection, they, they sort of give their excess 
uh, sugar produced to the corals, which then can grow, produce the limestone rock as a skeleton and, and keep living. But in the case of warming temperatures, as an example, if the temperatures get too hot, also too cold, but in, for the most part, we're seeing uh, too warm, almost like humans only having a, a narrow temperature range we can uh, survive in. The coral, almost like white blood cells, thinks, okay, I'm feeling sick. It might be this algae. It expels the algae that takes care of it, uh, exposing its pure white limestone skeleton, which is where we get the term coral bleaching from. And if the temperatures don't recover to the sort of normal range, then the corals eventually can starve to death and die. And a, a mass coral bleaching event is the equivalent of a hundred year flood. So a flood so strong should only happen every hundred years. And we've had five major global bleaching events since 1998 and currently are projected to have one every other year by mid century. So this is a problem that is happening now and it's only going to get worse. I, 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 this is, I mean, it, it's shocking when you hear this. I, I've read it so many times, but, you know, in a conversation all at once, how far are we from the point of no return uh, in terms of uh, the temperature of the oceans and the acidity of the oceans? Well, I don't want to give you the wrong answer because I'm not a climatologist uh, or an oceanographer, but best experts definitely have made it clear that we've got to get, and when I say we, governments, industry, the media, mm -hmm. those with power and responsibility to change things, putting aside pollution and overfishing and habitat destruction, we've got until 2030 to get a grip on greenhouse gas emissions to hit the 1.5 degree uh, goal to prevent really catastrophic consequences uh, from climate change. So we've we've got about, you know, eight years. Um, now, that's not to say everything needs to happen by then, but a lot needs to, too. Yeah. Um, and we're at an unfortunate point, too, where even if, let's just say tomorrow, the switch got flipped, we hit, you know, carbon negative, all the technologies mm -hmm. came online and policies were put in place, the oceans are going to keep warming, uh, which is why things like coral reef restoration still are necessary to be done hand in hand as an adaptation strategy in addition to these mitigation solutions uh, to ensure that we can basically deploy the infrastructure to do large scale reef restoration, to grow enough corals to put back out in the ocean so that they can survive until our, our leaders finally step up and figure out how to stop killing them in the first place. So it's, it's a big challenge and it's a ticking clock. Uh, I am, I like to start, describe myself as an optimistic realist. We've got a lot of work to do and if there's a lot of dire consequences ahead of us, but we still have time to implement solutions, uh, and to do, you know, what's necessary with the, the tools and power we have now to, to make sure things are as best as they can be for the future. Well, uh, before we talk about your process, because that's definitely what we want to get to, Let's talk about the policies that you would recommend we put in place to try to achieve uh, the preservation of what remains uh, by 2030. You've worked in the White House. You have you've worked with the UN on the sustainable, sustainable Development Goals. What do you recommend humanity do? And is there a governmental organization capable of doing it? I'd say yes. There, there, every government is capable of doing it. It, what's, okay. what we're facing right now is, is willpower. All right. More than anything, in, in my opinion, uh, we know what we need to do. It's clear. It's been clear for decades. What we're up against are a very narrow set of powerful interests uh, that have self-interest at mm -hmm. heart at the expense of pretty much everyone else. And often the argument gets made that it's going to be too expensive uh, to implement a lot of these solutions and, and to sort of you know, change energy policies and practices and the like. But in addition to actually creating a lot more economic opportunity by transitioning away from 19th and 20th century fuels to 21st century uh, you know, energy supplies, mm -hmm. uh, there's also the the financial cost of inaction is significantly higher in addition to the human costs and public health risks and biodiversity loss. But if you don't just look at it from a strictly financial bottom line perspective, the cost of inaction is far greater than the cost of acting today. And so what that comes down to 
is government and industrial leaders and people with influence in the media that have the power to influence storytelling um, to actually drive that needed action. So we should be listening to the scientific and economic experts who have made it very clear, here's what we can do and must do and rapidly do to avert catastrophic climate change together with, it's, it's worth noting, um, things beyond climate change. So if, let's just uh, imagine for a second that climate change okay. wasn't happening. Um, you still have destructive fishing practices and mm -hmm. pollution and a number of these different inputs that not only are impacting coral reefs, but in particular are impacting coral reefs. I'm going to use one example here in terms of overfishing. That might not spring to mind as how does overfishing impact coral reefs. This isn't to say we shouldn't be eating fish, but there are destructive fishing practices or the overconsumption right. of, of many key species where I mentioned the sort of the good algae, the symbiotic algae that lives inside the corals and feeds them. There's also other types of algae, algae uh, macro algae that compete with corals for space. And so let's just say there's a bleaching event, corals die. They can recover, but if there's no grazers, if there's no sea urchins or parrotfish or other key marine species that eat that algae, and the algae take over, and then there's no room for the coral to grow, and then the corals die further. And then there's less habitat for those fish, so then there's less fish, and it triggers this negative feedback loop. So we also need our uh, political and business leaders to step up for, to solve for all of these other sort of you know local or global uh, practices, including but also beyond climate change, to ensure that the ecosystems that sustain us all uh, can continue surviving into the future. So from the perspective of our listeners, let me just try to run down what I think you just said. First off, we have to stop using fossil fuels as soon as possible. Um, if not tomorrow, very soon. We have to change our fishing practices. And as, as we've talked about on the show before, it's very difficult to regulate those fishing practices around the globe. Um, but there, we need additional oversight of those practices. And finally, and as you pointed out, the seas are going to continue to warm because of the warm that they are the energy sink that absorbs most of the the, the heat in the, on the planet. As we transition to a, a post carbon economy, we're going to continue to have a warmer ocean. Are are is there a well? And that's really where the coral reforestation effort comes into play. How fast can we restore coral reefs if we really go all in on the project? That's a big question. I mean, we'll, we have to completely change things. Uh, one of the reasons okay. why we started Coral Vita uh, is because of scale. So there are amazing coral restoration scientists and practitioners around the world that have been working on this issue for decades. And it's kind of akin to reforestation, right? We should mm -hmm. stop cutting down forests, but you still can you know, plant trees and, and bring ecosystems back to life. That's kind of what coral reef restoration is like. But most projects have either been scientific in nature or small scale and grant funded. And mm -hmm. uh, in addition to a number of limits on ecological species diversity to the ability to, you know, to, to strengthen corals ability to better survive, so that's to kill them. Grants and donations are only going to take folks so far. And I formerly worked at an NGO doing coral farming with a grant from the United Nations. And it let us grow 5,000 pieces of coral once while I was uh, in Mauritius. And mm -hmm. again, think of that as 5,000 tree saplings. And then the funding expired. And one island nation like Mauritius alone needs closer to 5 million corals every year. And right. so in terms of what we need to do, and this is where we sort of took a different approach with Coral Vita, is we launched our organization as a mission-driven business. Mm -hmm. So I've been a diver since I was a kid. I love the ocean, full stop. But clearly the, the nature-based argument on its own hasn't moved the needle enough for us to as we just discussed, stop killing coral reefs. And so we're looking at how through tourism and coastal protection and fisheries, the value of reefs is so immense that all the customers and stakeholders that depend on those benefits, hotels, insurance companies, governments, development agencies, corporate sponsors, you name it, they should be paying to restore the ecosystems that they depend on. And so as far as the shift that's needed, we think there needs to be this and there's a huge opportunity for many people beyond just us. 
this whole restoration economy to merge, to transition this from a sort of small scale off the shelf space to a fully fledged uh, mission driven industry that can then grow millions and ultimately billions of corals in a financially sustainable way. And that's what we're trying to do through our model, working in partnership again with other restoration practitioners, but getting the private sector in particular to uh, come into this space so that projects are funded at large scale to make that needed difference. And that's where well, we should go. I mean, we should be think we should be thinking about coral reefs to be just as pragmatic as possible as natural infrastructure. You know, in the U.S., the big infrastructure bill passed. Just as one example, coral reefs, in addition to the, you know, biodiversity benefits, in addition to being a, you know, powerful tourism draw for snorkelers and tourists, a healthy reef can reduce wave energy on average by 97%. And so if we're thinking about, say, South Florida, which has had sea level rise and increasing storms, it's expensive and not long lasting to, to do traditional sort of gray infrastructure or, you know, seawalls and, and rock breakwaters. But if you can create a living breakwater by restoring a coral reef that self repairs and grows and then has all these added benefits that create jobs and has tourism draw and boosts fishery stocks and then protects property and lives, that's kind of a win, win, win. And so that's the dynamic I and we think needs to change in order to really transform as your original question was getting towards the way that we take care of uh, these ecosystems. Well, I think it's really important that we, we do tap into the environmental incentive or the environmental, excuse me, the economic incentives related to the environmental services that are provided by nature across the board, not just in the seas. Uh, and, and it's really interesting to me that you're thinking about this as a business. How, how do you then, for lack of a better way of putting it, get paid to do the work? Are you working with companies now, uh, such as resorts that are interested in, in preserving the reefs that are nearby? Yes, we, we've signed our first restoration contract. So that the core pillar of our, our new business model is the idea of restoration as a service. So you know, people have heard of mm -hmm. software as a right. service, kind of riffing on that a little bit. So yeah, hotels that rely on snorkel and scuba tourists, governments with national economic or uh, livelihood interests, uh, you name it, anyone that depends on reefs can hire us. And so we signed our first restoration contract actually last year. We're, we're operating currently out of Grand Bahama, where we launched our first coral farm. And we want to do this work all around the world where there are reefs, but you know, we're sort of an early stage social enterprise and this is farm number one. So government of the Bahamas uh, hired us to restore a local reef here last year. We also signed a contract with the Grand Bahama Port Authority and are uh, part of a, a forthcoming project led by the Nature Conservancy called Bahamas Reefs funded by the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, which is a new financing mechanism that can really spur a lot of uh, cash flow towards the space for protection and restoration. And we've got solicitations from local resorts uh, as well as other stakeholders here in the Bahamas. And we're also building a pipeline beyond uh, this country. You actually mm -hmm. can't take corals across borders and put them in the wild. So we're really? not we're not getting to those yet. Yeah, it's uh, an interesting, uh, there's something called the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, which is an amazing uh, treaty to help with you know wildlife protection and whatnot. It was written though back in the day when reefs weren't dying, and so even though here in the, I mean, you don't want to promote sort of spread of invasive species. So I'm on board for right. well, principle, yeah. but I, I can I can legally you know permit in hand take corals from here in the northern part of the Bahamas, Grand Bahama, take them hundreds of miles away to the southern Bahamas, but even though they're the exact same species, uh, without some pretty serious exemptions couldn't take them 60 miles away to Florida. So mm -hmm. that is a, an interesting quirk that we navigate, but uh, that's all to say that we have started engaging uh, and getting hired by uh, customers for these restoration contracts. So I understand why you would want to prevent the invasive species, uh, uh, invasive coral species. So when, let's talk a little about your process. You grow saplings, coral saplings, for lack of a better description, on land, and then you transfer them into the wild. What happened? How do you deal with a, a form of coral that may have been wiped out already? Can you bring in a different species and not do damage to the local environment? That's really a theoretical question. That's not something we've tested. We only use native species right now. So okay. here in the Bahamas, we're only using corals found in the Bahamas. 
you can't Frankenstein a coral. Um, there's, you can't, you can't bring a dead coral back to life, but you can, uh, as one potential way to sort of help accelerate the regrowth process is you could plant mm -hmm. corals on top of a uh, dead skeleton to sort of resheath it almost and, and take advantage of the existing limestone that's out there to, to provide habitat or reduce wave energy as the corals we've outplanted grow. Um, there could be opportunities and there are, there are some pretty serious coral scientists who five years ago would have probably chased you out of the room with pitchforks for suggesting this that are now saying it might be a real possibility that we there are, you know, areas off the south coast of Cuba or in the Red Sea or, or different places around the world where, say, it's already hotter uh, and corals have existed for a considerable period of time growing and thriving in those conditions. So maybe since they're already naturally more heat tolerant, uh, they could be brought to other places. So we're not touching that right now. There, it's, it is a possibility. Um, but here in the Caribbean, at least, we know that the corals that are found in the Bahamas are the same as Cuba and same in Mexico. It's uh, the same sort of 50 or 60 species are found here, whereas it, it definitely gets trickier when you're looking at the Pacific or the Red Sea when you're getting into 100 species. And sometimes the, the difference from one, one island to the next could have completely different species. So we want to be mindful of uh, not only sort of the legal, but also the ecological implications of despite best intentions coming in and throwing things off. It's also something that has to be considered again, going back to that ticking clock. Is it better to have some reefs than no reefs? So um, with, there's a lot of questions that are being posed within the, the greater coral science community about how do we, what strategies do we have to take to ensure reefs are alive? Uh, now, do you foresee in an, uh, a world in which like, people are now planting trees as part of making a, a purchase that they are also restoring coral uh, a, a, and adding a dollar for coral to a purchase. In the, uh, and, and how do you grow Coral Vita based on what you know about people's willingness to participate in supporting this work? I think it's a huge opportunity. There, there actually are already people uh, working with other restoration organizations where on their you know holiday they might be scuba certified and they pay to plant corals it's a pretty fun uh, thing to do on your trip uh with with our model in addition to sort of having things like that our farms are based primarily on land so traditional ocean uh nurseries are, are usually out in the water uh which is a, it is a lovely day at the office but they are certainly not as accessible let alone mm -hmm. scuba diving and, and snorkeling. But I mean, there's plenty of people that don't know how to swim. So our land-based farms, in addition to, we think, being much more scalable, if we have enough land, we can supply an entire island or nation's reach from a single site. It gives us control uh -huh. over the conditions in the tanks we grow the corals to stress harden them and, and boost their resiliency for things like climate change. They also are, you can walk right up to them. Uh, so actually, uh, later today at the farm, we're going to be hosting a, a tour of visitors and through entrance fees, uh, that can also help fund more restoration work through that ecotourism component, while also providing a, an educational, you know, experience for people who might not know why coral reefs matter, what's happening to them, or what we can do to protect them. And that educational component is actually key for us too. We also take a community-based approach to our model, using the farms in addition to tourism centers, also as education centers for local students and fishermen and, and hiring locally as much as possible and building that capacity. Um, but as we do that, there's also an online feature we have where people can adopt a coral. Um, mm -hmm. We're exploring brand partnerships. And so again, the, the, we really believe that if we can unlock funding in a sustainable fashion, that can then allow us to do ecosystem scale restoration. So there's definitely an opportunity for individuals uh, to do their part for us or, or supporting other coral restoration organizations, I think it's going to be a, a really cool and big thing moving forward. Well, I, I hope that people will uh, take some time to visit the site, particularly uh, at coralvita.co slash adopt dash a dash coral so that you can start to support coral restoration yourself right now. There, you have both individual and corporate adoption programs. Tell us what's involved in, in an individual adoption. So for $50, uh, you can sponsor the collection, growth, and outplanting of a coral microfragment. So I didn't really talk about microfragmenting yet, but uh, it's this method where corals can be sort of 
cut up into these tiny pieces, these micro fragments from an original parent colony. Okay, like a tree graft in a way. In a is sense, that- yeah. And, and what it does is it, it, it kind of triggers a, a healing process, almost like scar tissue. And then these micro fragments fuse back into themselves so that huh. we can grow a coral the size of a, a you know dinner plate or a basketball in a matter of months and years rather than decades and centuries. And so mm-hmm. for $50, you, you sponsor this micro fragment uh, through the whole journey. Uh, which you can then give it as a gift. You can sort of personalize it, and then you get access to our our member portal, which then has updates on our work and a lot of other sort of fun features and the like. Uh, there's also opportunities to adopt a coral cookie, uh, so that we basically take a number of micro fragments, put them on this little disc, and that it all fuses together into that bigger coral. Um, there's also opportunities for people to sponsor the sort of six month growth cycle of an entire tank that can contain up to a thousand, uh, micro fragments. So that's the, in a nutshell right now, the, the adopt a coral program that we offer. So how big does the restorate the coral restoration industry have to be in order for us to make real progress globally? Significantly bigger. How many people I mean, would you like to have working on this by 2030? whether it's through your organization or others? Tens of thousands of people, if not more. I mean, and that's what we need and that's what I want. And, and, you know, it's an interesting thing as someone who runs a business where not only do I hope to get put out of business, which unfortunately isn't going to happen anytime soon, given the state of the world's reefs, but where more people coming into this space, maybe that's viewed as a sort of, you know, competitors in the traditional business lens, but it's actually fulfilling our mission. And we do already collaborate with a number of other restoration practitioners and organizations. And so uh, there needs to be, I mean, this should be like baseline infrastructure. Every nation on earth should have large scale land-based coral farms that are able to supply reefs with millions and ultimately billions of corals. And so we hope to build, operate, or power uh, on our own or in partnership farms in every country. I mean, that's our big vision. We've kickstarted a restoration economy and you've got good local jobs that are making real impact on the reefs that are self-sustaining. Um, but right now, while there's an incredible group of, you know, dedicated people in this space, it still is fairly small, uh, and disparate and you know, low tech and bootstrapping. So we, really have an opportunity, I think, to transform how this is done, show you can do um, real, meaningful, impactful work that's critically needed in a, in a different way. So that's where I I want to see us go and, and, frankly, where we need to go. Well, Sam, I think it's really important, and, and I congratulate you on pursuing that social entrepreneurship, because it's not just about restoring the corals, but then the fisheries around the coral everything can come back to life. And we've seen that with some of the forest uh, restoration programs that we've talked to on the show as well, that you, you bring back an economy, not just a tree. And so thank you very much for sharing the story. And we look forward to keeping up with you as the story evolves. Thanks so much, Mitch. And thanks to everyone who's listening. Hopefully you'll be able to come down to the Bahamas and plant corals with us one day soon. And um, hope everyone has a great day. Well, thank you. We've been talking with Sam Teacher, the founder of Coral Vita, and you can find out more at coralvita.co. That is all one word, coralvita.co. In particular, check out how to adopt a a coral reef and uh, take some time and think about this. If you've planted trees, consider planting and and nurturing coral as well. You know, folks, another thing about this is we talk about nature and it would be great for all of us to be able to travel all these places and see nature ourselves. But of course, there's an impact associated with our travel. So pick your your travel, pick your targets and the important things that you want to see and do in your life and, and use the planet and its resources carefully. Everything about nature is up in the air right now. Let's see if we can bring it back down to earth in a way that will preserve not only all of us, but every species on this planet. This is Earth 911 Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe. We'll be back with another interview soon. In the meantime, folks, please do take a few minutes to share this podcast and all the others that we've done with your friends and family. Get them thinking about more ideas so we create less waste and can restore the environment. We'll be back soon. In the meantime, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a green day.